and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. He is the madman behind Blur, behind Blur Havoc, as well as well as its associated YouTube channel. A a writer, a gym a gym rat, and 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 one of the people who can cl who can clown on High Point like the rest of us do here. The one and only Alistor Hakon. I hope I got that pronounced right. How are you doing today, man? Doing all right. Um, didn't know we were in a temple. I'm smoking a cigar right now. My bad. No, don't worry about that. I'm not that. I'm not that kind of temple. Then again, ev everybody acts surprised when I tell when I tell them that monks drink. Like, do they not? Do they, have they not ever heard of Trappist monks build, um, brewing their own beer or anything like that? Well, I guess it fits some doctrine if you make it yourself. So. Well, you're in the middle of nowhere. You got you got to make money somehow. True. Uh oh. But. I, sp I suppose I'll sp I suppose the best place to start is the hum is the humble beginnings. Now, us usually, whenever I've done this with ta with tabletop folk, I usually go into how they got into the hobby. In your case, what I'd like to ask is um some is some is how Blur Havoc came came to be. Oh boy. <laughs> um. Well, it's a little. It's honestly a little embarrassing, but you know. Nothing to be ashamed of. Um, so basically, Blur Havoc started as um, started as like how do I put this in as in the least cringe way possible? Um, basically, started as a Sonic fan comic. Basically, I was the kid in high school or middle school that drew his own comics and stuff, mm -hmm. and it started out as like Sonic fan characters. So basically, I I was making Sonic OCs. Do not steal, you know. Um, but at some point, I realized I had to evolve past Sonic in order to, you know, actually, one, make money off of my content, and two, to actually grow as an artist, I had to let go of that crutch. Mm -hmm. Which it is is certainly is certainly understandable. And I'm I'm guessing I'm guessing that it's one is one of those things where the concept was that was there in some form initially, but it got iterated upon it got iterated upon through time. Right, like over what like well over fifteen years. Mm hmm. And in a lot in a lot of TTRPGs, you'll, there'll be a section or there or its equivalent called Appendix N. Sometimes this is just, sometimes this is referred to as recommended re, uh, recommended material. So in your case, what I'd I'd like to ask is to go th oh, go through some of the media that play that played a factor in iterating upon uh, what would become blur, what would become Blur Havoc as it is now. Hmm. Let's see. Well, for starters, I know for a fact that uh, the the Mass Effect series definitely did inspire Blur Havoc, um, mainly with uh, focusing on character and like focusing on like creating characters that the the reader will be interested in and want to know more about. Even to the point where like in Mass Effect games, you find out little intricacies of the characters, such as like. Garrus doesn't like ha hospitals and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of the biggest inspirations. Um, but even smaller things like, uh, like you know, big blockbuster movies. You know, like mm -hmm. of course, as you can tell from a lot of my content on my channel, Transformers is one of them. Uh, Sonic is one of them, mainly because it's more of like a like a good indicator of how to treat characters as a brand mm -hmm. so that when you look when you look at a picture of Sonic you get an idea of what that character is without even like hearing someone explain how that character behaves you know um but yeah in terms of like inspirations mostly mostly Mass Effect for certain mm -hmm. oh. 
it is it is funny you bring up both Mass Effect and and Sonic in that regard, uh, because, and this was something I de I definitely noticed with some of the designs, is try is is applying applying a few simple um, point points of emphasis instead of instead of getting instead of getting lost in the details, which is a bad habit I've seen with a lot of designers. It's one of the reasons why I keep why I keep clowning on on um. On, char on character designs in superhero mo superhero movies over the last few years, as well as the as well as the character designs in say the last few Mortal Kombat's. Oh yeah, um, that's one big problem in in a lot of these movies now is that it started off, or you know, superhero movies, especially in the Marvel universe, where it started out as like each character had its own intricacies with their costume like they had a, a specific silhouette and you know specific features and after a certain point around like phase three everyone has basically has iron man armor where the helmet comes off on command so it's definitely something that they've kind of lost their way on in a certain regard yeah i i would i would say there's a bit of this there's a bit of designer itis but i'd also say um, it's the cur it's the curse of quote unquote realism. Yeah. Um, one of the mantras I have in my temple is believability trumps realism. And part of part of the reason I I always have that mantra is real is that trying to make when you end up trying to shoot for realism, it actually ends up go going against creativity. In my experience, yes, yeah. yeah, it's it's definitely a balancing act. Um, because in my books, there is a degree of realism. Um, because I want, you know, I want like my universe to be basically my f design philosophy for my universe is that it's basically our current universe with a few deviations here and there. Biggest one being uh, aliens, but um. But the biggest thing I had to learn, especially with my most recent book, was that sometimes you have to stray away from... You have to not get worried about realism. Because there was this whole... A very specific example is that there was this whole thing where I was going to explain how these giant robots in this universe, like, disobey the square cube law and how the designer of those robots got past it. And it was just like, nobody cares in the long run. <laughs> It's a giant robot. Just focus on that, basically. Or at the at the very least, if you if you apply that if you apply that there's a certain type of tech that's unique to this set, that's unique to this setting and and keep and keep it consistent, then ev then no then nobody's gonna raise a fuss. Right. Like there is like there is an exa uh, example. Um, there is an explanation for how it defies the square cube law. But it's not necessary to understanding the story at this moment, you know. Mm -hmm. Like if there's like a a lore like book or a codex or something like that, it can be put there, but it's not necessary to understanding the story. Yeah. The like just using Mass Effect as an example, it ha it has that with how so much of its technology is based around the. You, the usage and implementation of element zero, right? Whether whether that be it showing up, in, whether that be it showing up in people, which is how you get biotics, or the or the or or the miniaturized use of it in firearms, or the macro use of it when it comes to the mass relays. Right. Yeah. Uh, and the titch and of course the titular mass effect in that in that setting is. A is um is all built around a violation of the law of conservation of energy. But ever but that yeah. one that one little change is just um just spi just spirals out into all the other um, effects like a like setting up dominoes. Right, and from a storytelling perspective, that's like great for like the lore and immersion and all of that. Mm -hmm. But um. One thing you'll realize is that you can literally play through the entire trilogy and you can literally not know what Mass Effect is in terms of like the actual law of physics in the universe. 
you can play without knowing what Ezo does, how people get biotics, um, how the mass relays work. You can play the entire trilogy without knowing any of that. And and that's what I mean by like it's good to have that information and actually think about that. But it's important to make sure that you don't bog your audience down with like all the details when they're not necessary for the story at hand. You know? Especially, like the focus of that trilogy is the Reapers and we want to focus on that, you know? Especially since um you're pl you're playing you're playing the story of Commander Shepard who is a career soldier, not an engineer. Right. He's just like, I need my gun to work. I don't care how it works. It just needs to work. Mm -hmm. Now, if we have like a tally game or a, like, yeah, basically tally. If we have a tally game, then sure, we can get into that. But that information is relevant to her, not to Shepard. Yeah. And... I, yes, there is the there is the tech avenue when it comes when it comes to character creation in Mass Effect, but that's no different than say a um say the engineer position in an army. Right. You know, it's a it's a type of spe it's a type of specialist, but all that matters is that the specialized tech works. Right. Like if they're like in the mess hall and somebody asks how the tech works and they can explain it there but you know when you're getting rained down on with our artillery fire and stuff it's like I don't need to know that right now yeah um of course if they're in the mess hall some um I hope to god they didn't get stuck on KP <laughs> um kit kitchen patrol oh, the, yeah. one, the one job nobody the one job nobody <laughs> wants but it out of cur out of curiosity, were you familiar at all with the with the Archie comics when it came to Sonic? Uh, not like you know, I'm not an aficionado, but I did read a few of the books. Mm -hmm. Um, like I'm familiar with some of the larger arcs, like the arc where like Sonic got lost in space for like a whole year, and the arc where uh, uh what's his name, Scourge replaced him in his universe. Um, I'm familiar with some of the arcs, but not, not many of them. You know, yeah. it's yeah because because of the fact that we that we've been talking on story on storytelling, and you brought up Sonic, it was something I f I felt I should um, bring up, and I I'd, I'd be tempted to bring up IDW, but no, but but <laughs> nobody's reading IDW these days. If the numbers I keep getting any every month are any indication. Oh yeah, yeah, they're <laughs> struggling right now. Well, they've they've been they've been struck they've been struggling for years. I, th I remember I remember I remember years ago you had Umbrella Guy talking talking about their 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 numbers and how they kept being in the red more and more and more. Oh yeah, and then it it only got worse when they lost the license to Transformers. Mm -hmm. Which I I likened I likened to um and to any any major whenever whenever you have a um. A the big the big draw be, big being lost, um, like say, when the when the uh, guys who made Image ended up um, jumping ship from Marvel, or if I have to use a wrestling example, um, when the formation of pro wrestling Noah, which was when which was when Mr. Haru Misawa who fe who felt who was getting si getting real sick of the fact that he couldn't really. Do anything, even if he was head booker, because everything had to go through, um, but everything had to go through Baba's wife. So he's like, "Screw this! I'll just make my own promotion." And he took most of the top talent of all Japan with him. Mm -hmm. Like there, were, of all of all the top talent, only two people stayed. And mm. yeah, all Japan, I can see that. All Japan eventually recovered, if only because they managed to bring in um, Keiji Muto, aka the Great Muto, who reinvented himself. But it was a rough period and rife with a whole lot of drama. But it is funny you bring it is funny you bring up Transformers, given I've had a complicated relationship with tra with Transformers, and more recently so when they decided to, when when ha when Renegade decided. 
Yeah, let, let's make it. Let's make a Transformers RPG along along with a along with a GI Joe one. Okay. Oh yeah, I saw that somewhere. Um, and this was after they did their Power Rangers RPG that managed to piss me off. <laughs> mm. Um. Yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, you can't you know you can't mention Transformers without having mixed emotions. Honestly. <laughs> yeah. And uh, obviously, the Bayformers are a perfect example of that overdesign I talked about. Mm -hmm. I'd say, I'd say, even, even the original run, it's some of some of it has gotten better, but better only by a little bit over over the over the last few years. Yeah, like it, they definitely took a a step in the right direction of Bumblebee, but excuse me, but um. They seem to want to like find that middle ground with the most recent movie, where they were like, "We still kind of want to harken back to Bay, but we want to keep the G one kind of like look for some some of the characters." Mm -hmm. but, um, but it's like it's like they have they don't have any faith that like they can stick to something so close to the source material and keep the admittedly large babe formers fan base you know with the with the franchise though if if i'm be, if i'm being honest sometimes sometimes a ritual burning is necessary oh yeah definitely uh, like as 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 much of as much of an annoyance as the film scream was in a roundabout way you could see that as a ritual burning for horror just oh, yeah. just an attempt to kill because of how Inescapable, inescapable and ubiquitous the slasher villain had become in the 80s to the point that it smothered out any kind of horror that you could do yeah and like and Scream was like a it wasn't just like a it wasn't just like a ritual burning it was also like a like a lampshading of like horrors like most tired tropes you know yeah and Eventually, eventually we start. Event, and I'd say in a roundabout way, that's how we ended up getting something like Saw. And yeah, Saw, Saw ended up overstaying its welcome, but the for the first movie in that in that series still holds up as a as a ch as a kind of chamber play. Yeah. Uh, of course, of course, in the in the time since you have arthritis because there's this there's this idea of we need to keep. We need to keep, we need to keep escalating at over and over and over to the point of parody. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, that reminds me of uh, what's his name, Blake Snyder. He wrote a book called Save the Cat, and this book was written back in two thousand five. But he one hundred percent hit the nail on the head of like a lot of what's going on in Hollywood to this day. Um, like his. He explains that the reasoning why we get so many sequels and, you know, adaptations and we don't get anything original in Hollywood is that they, Hollywood wants baked in fan bases. They want surefire hits. They want guaranteed audiences. And the only way to do that is to either adapt something or just make 16 sequels of something. Making an original, like, movie with an original idea is one of the scariest things to Hollywood. Nope. But ironically, that's what Hollywood needs to survive, because as we've seen with all these movies in June, like we're not, they're not winning right now. No, it's been no, it's been it's been a race to the bottom, and yeah. I, I had, I've I've always argued that um, that t taking taking shots at Hollywood for a, for a fear of this kind of thing is. Is is nice and all, and I'll, I will ha I will happily engage in that in that um in that. I was gonna say slander, but it's not slander if it's true. That sort that sort of bullying. <laughs> but on the other hand, I do I do think the audience should bear should bear some of the responsibility just to, instead of just. Treating the instead of just using the um, using Hollywood as a boogeyman. Oh yeah, yeah. It's because, because um, like with I'm, big industries like that, it's it's hard to pin it on like one reason. You know, it's a massive billion dollar industry, so we can't just say, oh, Hollywood did everything wrong. You know. 
Well, the reason I say some of it should be pinned on the audience is that is that audience rel- is. I don't think it's entirely fair to just blame, to just blame the to just blame Hollywood, quote unquote, when, so, when something it when a new idea is put out and the audience that claims that we need new ideas doesn't show up. Oh yeah, like um, what was that movie? Um, Age of Tomorrow. That was a that was a new idea back in 2014, and like barely anybody saw it. You yeah. know. Um, actually, one one of the big one of the. I'd say one one of the bit one of the bigger examples I will I will use for the purposes of this it was the original reception to Pacific Rim, which did very oh, yeah. well internationally, but didn't do well in the, didn't do well stateside. It was yeah. it was certainly a new, it was certainly a new idea. And again, again, the blame go the blame goes both ways because there's been original ideas that were that were bad just beca- that didn't do well just because they were bad. And and at the same at the same time, coming from the tabletop realm that that I do, I've seen so many times people being frustrated about how about how everybody about how nobody wants to do anything other than D and D, and yet when they have the opportunity to do something else, especially since there's places like Start Playing Dot Games or the or the Roll Twenty LFG subreddit. And and just and and several sites that are solely dedicated to get people to playing a variety of games, even pay, even paid DM positions for that kind of thing. They don't put their money where their mouth is. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because that just that just has to do with human nature, and like we as humans, we just don't like change. Change is scary. Oh, change change is scary. Where I draw the line is is when pe- is when people ta- is when people talk uh, talk all that shit and then can't back it up. Right. Like if if you want to if you want to say that you prefer you prefer those comforts, that's fine. But it it's not it's not the best look to make that kind of claim. And that and then when you have the opportunity to to back to back it up, not do so. Right. Oh. Uh, because. No- uh, cause even the, you know, like the Marvel, the MCU universe, like the MCU had to start somewhere. We had to get Iron Man, you know, it had to start. And like, that's something that we fail. We is not like a general, we like as an audience, we fail to understand that, you know, in order to get the next MCU, we have to support original ideas, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, there's an analogy I often use called the, that's. Akin to a dog sitting on a nail, which is not, which is based on an old folktale of of this dog who kept howling when he was sitting on a, because the spot on the porch he was sitting on had had an, had a exposed nail, and but he wouldn't but even though he was howling about how much it hurt, he wouldn't move from that spot. Mm. Um, yeah, that's applicable. And in my in. The, re- the reason why I use why I use the D and D analogy is uh, is obviously obviously that's the that's the big name that ev- that everybody knows, but there's this idea that you can use that to run all kinds of fantasy. I in my formative years attempted to 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 run to run it in um in less less of a Lord of the Rings style approach and far and far more of a um, far more of a samurai style approach. This was before I discovered Legend of the Five Rings. Having to, having to, the amount of work that I had to do just to make just to make custom setups because shields aren't a, shields aren't a thing in in feudal Japan. Right. Uh, as well as as well as the fact that a that that the use of magic isn't get, isn't going to be the same, and so many other things just aren't just aren't going to mesh. I ended up I ended up having to make a whole game in all in all but name. Mm. Yeah, that's in all honesty, that's how most original ideas are. It's just taking something that you're familiar with or inspired by and just, you know, making change. It's like yeah. it's the same but different, you know. Though 
when it comes to how when it comes to house ruling a a game, my policy has always been house ruling should be a spice. Like I shouldn't if if it's supposed to be built for all kinds of fantasy, I shouldn't have had to do that extensive of work. Yeah. Uh, I know I know that runs counter to what you mentioned about creating original ideas, but within within the tabletop space, it's always it's not as sim- it's not as simple. Um, and how th- th- when it comes to this whole Iron Age thing, that's been that's been my frustration that everybody seems to act like um, t- like tabletop gaming is this lost cause in that in that form. When it because mm. whenever 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 there's some ma- whenever Wizards of the Coast does some major screw up, everybody acts like the whole like that applies to the whole of the space when that's not the case. Right. Uh, it'd be it'd like especially especially the especially those who cl- who talk who talk about le- about leaving the big two when it comes to Marvel and DC, but when it comes to tabletop games, they're not willing to make that same leap, even though it's arguably easier. <laughs> yeah, because it's like they like in order for you to get a big two, you know, you have to support them. So, in order to like possibly get a big three, you'd have to support a third option. Mm-hmm. Um, and for- fortunately, in, in because of the whole OGL fiasco, there's a bunch of people who have been making that leap, and those are the ones I've tried to highlight. <laughs> especially, especially since a lot of companies decided to just make their own open license. Yeah. Um, Pinnacles, Pinnacles doing that with Savage Worlds. Modifus is doing it with 2D20. Um, ba- um, Chaosium, jo- Chaosium joined up with Pi- with Paizo and a bu- and, a bu- and a bunch of others when it comes to the open role playing content license, which is not which is which contrary to popular belief is not owned by Paizo but rather the Azora Law Group, a IP firm that helped with the original open gaming license back in two thousand. Um, but get, getting back to the to the matter of of Blur Havoc. There's one concept that I remember being brought up in script writing that I'm curious if you if you ended up developing, and that is what's known as a series bible. Mm, actually, yes, uh, that was that was one of the not the first, but it was like the second thing I did is that I wrote the first book, and then I wrote a quote unquote series bible. Mm-hmm. Um, as like kind of a way of it helping because a lot of like sequels and like false like cinematic universes and universes that got false starts where they wanted to copy what marvel did and they failed to do it because they didn't have a plan they didn't have a series bible um i realized i needed a series bible as soon as possible um so i developed like the lore and the the history of the universe and all of that um and parts of this series Bible can actually be seen right now on a website. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, anybody listening, they can look it up. It's the what did I call that thing again? The New Valhalla City Codex mm-hmm. or New Valhalla City Council Codex, one of those. Yeah. Um, and it's basically um, all of the the series Bible notes and history of this universe um, that I'm willing to share at this moment because you know I don't want to spoil things that happen in the future, but. Um, everything I'm willing to share is on that website at this mm-hmm. moment. Yeah, and of course, the importance of of having that, and I, I'd like to say I came up with the idea, but obviously I didn't. Is keep is keeping everything internally consistent, right? Since it's vi- it's very easy to to just add, to just add more and more lore onto things to the point where it collapses under its own weight. Oh. Um, I'd say I'd say the big two when it comes to comic universes are very guilty of this. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, as well as well as authoritis, where new authors feel they have to do something to top what came before. And I, if I have to use, if there's one big example I, I would use, consider consider the Monitor in DC when he fir- when he first showed up in. Um, Crisis on Infinite Earths. There was just the there was the Monitor and the Anti Monitor, a be- beings who were at, who were there at the dawn of at the dawn of the 
of the universe and and all the universes that came with it then then there's this notion that there's multiple then um during the whole countdown debacle there is the notion of multiple monitors that exist and all of all of them appar apparently having different names but lo but looking very similar to each other which ends up diluting the special factor of the monitor yeah and that that comes with one of my I'm I'm actually planning on doing a whole video on this but um that's one of my pet peeves with writers is retcons I absolutely hate retcons because they just they they're often oftentimes sloppily done and they contradict information that was given before in in a way that makes you ask way more questions than actually be satisfied with the thing that you were introduced to you know mm -hmm. and some I try I've I try to play devil's advocate when I can when it comes to retcons because so, because sometimes I think the the only time that it can actually work is when you is when you is when you're relying on narrative on a narrative where there's there isn't complete understanding of a situation, right? Um, like if yeah, it's like I don't, I don't want people to you know think I absolutely hate retcons like completely as like a binary thing. It's more so that like I hate how retcons are usually ap applied because they're usually done in a really sloppy way. But retcons can be done well. It's just they're not done well. Yeah. Oh, and I'd I'd say I'd say the best way to apply retcons is the is not far away from the right ways to apply a tw a um a twist in a story. Right. Is like it you have to like plan for the retcon, you know. You can't just say, "Well, actually it was this," you know. You don't you don't want to do that. Yeah. The That's Obviously, obviously, one of the big examples of a retcon, even if some might argue otherwise, would be the whole the whole thing with Va the whole thing with Vader in, um, in Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. But when I ended up looking at the behind the scenes, part of the reason that was done was was to was Lucas felt he wrote himself into a corner because he had introduced way too many characters. Mm. And the, the whole. The whole it was it, it was always there from a certain point of view was base was him gaslighting both himself and, and his staff. Yeah. Espe especially especially the whole the whole Luke and Leia being twins thing. He he claimed that was the plan all along. It wasn't. Oh yeah, from that <laughs> one that one kiss, we know that was never the plan. Oh, uh, and the 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 um the CCG called him out on it twice. <laughs> Because they put out a card, they put out a card having that kiss with the card titled "This is just wrong" and a follow-up called "This is still wrong." Yeah, I mean, like, and in terms of uh, that specifically, it's not the worst retcon, but it's definitely a retcon that, you know, as we as we just talked about, it has a lot of glaring, you know, moments that make you go, "That that definitely wasn't planned." Mm hmm But the and I, this and I I'd say a lot I'd say a lot of the retcon issue can be can be easily avoided by having a series bible. Right. Um, especially since you I'd say you often see retcons in in stories where there isn't one. Right. Like um like comic books that have to come out once a month, you know, they have seriously they have seriously bad retcon issues. Like um the wildest retcon to me that was really weird was the retcon about why Green Goblin killed Gwen Stacy. That was that was a really weird one. Um I'd say that was also an un an unnecessary one cuz that's that's the other thing that happens with with bad retcons is adding de adding details to things that did not need to be explained. Right, because it was already like a, at the time it was already a pretty, you know, like, kind of groundbreaking moment in comics to have the main character's love interest die. Um, so that moment in and of itself 
will always be cemented in comic book history as a, a hallmark. But to add this this weird, unnecessary information just makes you look back at that moment completely different now. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember. I remember. I remember. I remember. Um, Mole in at in Atlantis, which is un- which is underrated as a film. I will. I will note. Yeah. Whenever when there was that scene where everybody's giving a bit of their backstory and somebody and one of the characters asks about Mole's deal. Um, Sweet interjects and says, "You don't want to know." And then, then when they tried that TV series, which just ended up being made into the sequel movie, the explanation is he was raised by naked mole rats, which is can which is kind of lame. <laughs> yeah. Like. Yeah, like. Pretty much just as lame as when the MCU revealed how Nick Fury lost his eye. Oh yeah, I, rem- I remember. I remember that, and I, ne- I, I was like, in doing in by doing by doing that, and having it be an alien cat that took that took his eye out. Yeah, you ended up undermining what was a what was a very crucial scene in um, Civil War. That ex- I think you mean uh, Winter Soldier. Yeah, Winter Soldier. Sorry. Yeah, the two the two films kind of run together in my head. Oh yeah. Yeah, they do have a lot in common in terms of like the the cinematography and the color grading and all of that. Mm-hmm. But the and I do I do remember I do remember when um because we we do reconstructions here occasionally on 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 um one of these sideshows called Geek Watch and we did that for Captain Marvel. We did not put that thing in there. <laughs> oh yeah. In fact, one of the first things we did was move was move it to was move that instead of being an in between or between infinity war no just afterwards and just and just build and just bu- just build ar- just build around the I- the idea we had was to use that as the launching point for a phase 4 that would be built around secret invasion in the comics because it was too perfect not to like yeah cuz af- after phase 3 everybody knows aliens exist in some form or another they know we're not alone in the universe and that there's plenty of things out there that don't like that don't like Earth, right? And that's that's going to create a lot of uncertainty, and that's the perfect opportunity to have to have infiltrators. Yeah, because uh, the way they implemented the scrolls in Captain Marvel was not to put to say it was not the best way is kind of putting it lightly. Well, because when we that movie is just retcon the movie basically. Yeah, when we when. When we took our approach, one of the key, one of the things we really wanted to maintain is that yes, there's still there is still the pissing match between the Kree and the Skrulls, but neither side is the is is a side you want to well side with. They're right. both a- they they've always both been assholes. They've just been, they've just been assholes in different ways. Yeah, and that was one of the biggest flaws of Captain Marvel from like a world building standpoint was making the Skrulls like de facto good guys where that that should have never been the case because now we're seeing in secret invasion um, well i don't want to spoil secret invasion for can anyone you spoil that wants to watch something it, that's already rotten <laughs> i mean i guess not but you know some people enjoy that kind of stuff but yeah like with secret invasion they have to basically now say oh well now the scrolls are bad guys now when you wouldn't have had to do that if you just did it the right way to begin with, you know. Mm-hmm. And the the of course the the I do find I do find it amusing that when it comes when it comes to when it comes to works that have the, that have this retcon, um, comics seem to be the biggest offender, and in, yeah. parti- in particular. I say in particular superhero comics because of always needing to do that ongoing story. So if you look at com, you look at long-running comics or even short-run comics in other mediums, that's not really a thing because there's a be- there's a set beginning and end to a story. Sometimes right. there's a little bit of holes left in of, okay, if I want to do a sequel, then here then I can, then I can build off of these things, but I don't have to. Right. Like that's a that's a flaw with just 
not I won't even say Hollywood is just guilty of this. That's a flaw with just modern entertainment culture as a whole is that we just like are in a a period where we just want stories to go on forever and ever and ever when that's a relatively new phenomenon like the lord of the rings ended you know like the hunger games or there's supposedly they ended harry potter supposedly was supposed to end but mm -hmm. now we're just in the age of let's just run it until it runs into the ground and nobody wants to watch it anymore yeah, and the thing, the thing is, you can you can have too much of a good thing. Yeah. And I know I know that in and truth truth be told, when it, I'm not a, I'm not opposed to remakes, but I do feel that if you're going to do a if you're going to do a remake, then adding then um I won't say adding some to it, but making sure that that remake has its own identity should be paramount. And yeah, I'm, I'd say not even that. Like, it, if you're going to make a remake, you have to justify why you would make a remake. Like, justify the remake's existence, you know? You don't want to just, like, one of the most unnecessary remakes in recent memory was them was Naughty Dog remaking The First Last of Us. Yeah. Which was just like, why did, why did you even do that? And... Not only doing that, but doing it so, but doing it just so, re so recently. Right. Um, when it comes to video games, I, I will, I will be in favor of remakes of things that are hard to get. Um, a recent example yeah. is the fact that we're getting a remastered version of both of the Bot and Kaitos duology. Which yeah, like stuff that's either hard to get or really old and archaic. Um. This is also the reason I didn't bat an eye when Live Alive got that po got that remake on the Switch, because that is that has been one of those big white whales that was massively influential throughout the '90s, but it never but it never came stateside, and it was a very popular game to emulate. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and like um, like there's also the the point of like accessibility mm -hmm. in terms of like because um there the system shock series is a is a series i is right up my alley it should be something i'm interested in it's sci-fi it has to do with ai and it's in space and all of that it's like hard science fiction but i just can't get into it because it's a very archaic like game the the gameplay is really clunky and it's not it's honestly not fun to play it plays more like an operating system than a game but Sis the original Night Dive System with their... Shock has had far more in common with an immersive sim than a shooter, whereas yeah. the remake it's it has those immersive sim elements, but it ha but it has a more accessible control setup. Um, yeah, and that like now that they've remade it, I actually want to play it because when I f first saw the first System Shock in its original glory, it was like I I can't touch that. I, I'm getting a headache just looking at it. The enhanced edition is so, is somewhat better, but I'm not gonna, I'm not going to defend its original control setup. Um, it's a, this is also the same reason why, why I say if any, if anybody is interested in di in dipping into Golden, I say just go go play Golden Eye Source and don't look back. Because mm. well, Golden Eye Source is exactly what it sounds like. It's a source port of of Golden Eye, just using modern controls because. I, I have yet to find anybody who will outright say the controls for the N64 version were good. Oh yeah, that was... It was ironically revolutionary because it was like quote-unquote getting shooters right on console, but um, going back and playing it, it's like you can tell they were working with what they have. They weren't really like... You know, they weren't thriving in this environment. They just got it to work. Yeah. Especially, especially given the uh, the awkward aiming se um, setup. Yeah. Which was the reason why um, I remember back in the day we had a rule that if you picked odd job for any matches after the match we are all allowed to punch you in the nuts. <laughs> because and if because well unless you use the manual aiming controls it was almost impossible to hit odd job. Because oh they, yeah. Odd job was stocky in the films but he wasn't mini me. <laughs> he wasn't a yeah. He he wasn't a dwarf. 
Yeah, like in the original Goldeneye, like Odd Job is is the meta basically. Mm-hmm. If you wanted to win, you played as Odd Job. Um, I like I liken it to. It's it's in that band category, much like Meta Knight in Brawl or um, Eddie in Tekken Three. Yeah. Although, and... or like uh, like Sonic, if you were to turn on like the final smashes, like Sonic was like you couldn't play a Sonic. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, th- I suppose I suppose another another major example of of that was and was anybody who picked um. Um, Brad Brad Wong in DOA three. Oddly, oddly, en- oddly enough, w- oddly enough, w- for the same problem that pe- that people hated Eddie, just his f- you have a fighting style that is so so completely chaotic to read. Yeah, because Brad Wong uses drunken fist. <laughs> <laughs> so there's plenty, and because of the fact that three D fighters. Place a lot of emphasis on de- on attacking, defending, and defense at um, high, medium, and low. It's very it's very hard with him. It's very hard to read which angle he's going to be hitting. Yeah, like well, with Eddie, it's a little bit different. Where like, because I'm I'm not huge on Tekken. I've only played Tekken once. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like we had a, a get together at my house when I was in high school, and like my friend brought over Tekken, and I picked Eddie. And I literally just pressed buttons, and I won against my friend that brought the game over. Because Eddie just has this, like, very, like, chaotic and, like, bouncy kind of, like, attack, like, style. and Or, like, animation style that makes him very, very hard to read. Well, you, you, know, you know what his fighting style is, right? Yeah, it's like that weird... I don't remember the exact name of it. It's like that weird dancing kind of like fighting style capoeira yeah that one uh, which which because of its because of its roots in in dance um is is going to be hard, is going to be hard to read so it's it's certainly accurate to its source material <laughs> yeah for be, for better and for worse but and I'm, when it comes to when it Given the fact that you have that you have the a- that you have the alien factor and aliens li- living on the planet, there is there was one movie I'm curious if it was a bit of an influence, and that is District Nine. That's interesting, um, because I love District Nine. It was actually I think the first R-rated movie I ever saw in theaters. Um, I love District Nine, but it was funny enough. It was not an inspiration for Blur Havoc, but people that have read it said that it's very much like District 9, which I thought was an amazing coincidence. Yeah, and there, I know I know a lot of people like to throw around the term re- rip-off when it comes to these sort of things. I, do, I don't when I bring these sort of things up. It's more of an, int- it's more of an interesting um, coincidence in, in a lot of those cases. Although... Yeah, there's... Although some sometimes there sometimes I've seen direct I've seen directors or creatives who insist that something wasn't an influence, but it's hard to believe that 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 was the case. Like um, the director of Black Swan insisting that Perfect Blue was not an influence. Oh yeah, and the thing is that when it comes to influence versus ripoff, it's honestly a very thick line. It's it's obvious what the difference between an influence and a ripoff is. Is that a ripoff is like just like, like at, for example, like uh, like how Suicide Squad looked at like for their trailer for the first Suicide Squad, they looked at Guardians of the Galaxy and said, "Let's put old music in our trailer, and people will like our movie." That's clearly a ripoff. But mm-hmm. inspiration, you can tell that someone was influenced by something, but they wanted to have their own original spin on it. You know? Yeah. Um. The ex- the example I often use when it comes to establishing the the line between homage and ripoff is a line that was used in The Usual Suspects, aka the only good movie Brian Singer's ever made. Well, good ish. Look, as as much as, as groundbreaking as the as his X Men movies were, they're bland. Um. Yeah, bland on bland in a good 
you know, bland in good spots and then incredibly cheesy in like in a like in some spots. Mm-hmm. Um, Superman Re- Superman Returns was ju- was just hit, was just him kissing uh, Richard Donner's ass for two hours, and yeah. I don't even remember what happened in Valkyrie. I don't think I've seen. I don't think. I don't think I've seen that one. Yeah. But the usual. But but admit, but at at a certain point, there's the line: the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Now that I that there was that line was um was based was based on a line I think I think it was in. I keep thinking, I keep thinking Hamlet, but no, it wasn't. Ha- it wasn't Hamlet. I think it was Faust. And the original intent was of the line was not everything is as it seems. In the Usual Suspects, the line isn't is is put is is twisted on its head because it's the person who is actually Kaiser Soze saying it, who keeps being who is always alluded to as the devil. Mm. Oh, then I remember. I remember. I think. I think it was. I can't. I can't remember the. I can't remember the name of the film, but it was. A, it was some Seagal pick where they ended up using the line just, com- just completely unironically without any changes or any new context. The oh, former yeah. is an homage. The latter is a ripoff. Yeah, it's just like the director heard the line and said, "That's a cool line. I want to put it in here." Because. Mm-hmm. The reason why the reason why um, why you why you can go, why you can have the whole old music thing in Guardians of the Galaxy is largely rooted in Star Lord's character in that in that story, you know, being, being right. somebody from that particular era and time and getting th- and getting thrown into an unfamiliar world. Right. Especially since the original trailer for Guardians of the Galaxy prominently showed Awesome Mix Volume One. Yeah, like it was it was more of like a like the music was the music choice was done as an immersive choice because mm-hmm. it's allude it's implying that the music playing in the trailer is the music playing in Peter's like uh in his uh cassette tape player thing. I'm I'm not old enough to remember what that is. But um but in Suicide Squad it's just like we just picked Bohemian Ras- Raspberry Raspberry whatever it's called Rhapsody. just because yeah, Rhapsody. <laughs> um and we just picked that because it's old, and Guardians picked an old song too. So, mm-hmm. and I suppose, I suppose in the, I suppose one of the other big, big examples I can think of when it comes when it comes to that is how I remember. I remember it was kind. It was kind of funny seeing all the attempts at at Halo killers in the two thousands. Oh yeah. Um, the bi- it's the funny bi- how none of them succeeded. None of them succeeded. The most infamous case was Advent Rising. Oh yeah, that I don't even know how they were trying to kill Halo with that kind of game because it wasn't even similar to Halo in any way. It was that it was advertised heavily as a Halo killer. I yeah. I do know. I do know that, especially put, especially putting the trailer in th- in um in the th- in the theaters when when the Star Wars prequels were out. I distinctly remember that, and the mm. and the fact that they heavily they heavily boasted that they that they had gotten Orson Scott Card to help with writing, which is true, but also not true. This isn't this isn't like say George Martin work, working on Elden Ring, but when it came to the score with that, I guess somebody somebody said, "Well, Halo tries to go with tries to go with these cl- with these classical stylings of, of music in a in a sci-fi game." So let so let's do that with our sci-fi epic. Except the problem is they try and make everything sound epic without without realizing that you need to apply the rubber band policy. You know, stretching the rubber band for the tension and then letting it go to repeat the process. Yeah. When you make everything try and sound epic, nothing does. Plus, yeah, and that's that's kind of what uh, Destiny fell into as well. Is that it was just like playing epic music when you weren't doing anything, and it was like okay, it's kind of like 
you're kind of overloading me with all this music when nothing is happening. It's not enhancing the moment. You're just being obnoxious at this point. Mm -hmm. The big... One of the big reasons why why Halo pull, pulled off the pulled off the style of music it did is because is largely has to do with the Covenant and the fact that they that they view themselves on a religious crusade. Yeah. Um, uh, to the to the point where well they keep call, they keep calling Master Chief the demon. <laughs> oh yeah. And. As, and as and as a result of that, using using Gregorian chants makes per, makes perfect sense. Yeah, and that's kind of like the heart of like the difference between inspiration and a ripoff is that like with with inspiration or like something that you can tell was inspired is that there are design choices behind why they did something. Mm -hmm. You know, like they they actually had like a philosophy behind it, or they had a like you know. They, the the decision was made in tandem with the the storyline or the characters um, such as like with um, one of my favorite um, one of my favorite uh, games in recent history or recent memory was Doom Eternal because the music was designed with a specific philosophy behind it it wasn't just let's make awesome music which yeah it, even without the game it'd be awesome but it was designed with the philosophy of we don't want to frustrate and over overload the player, but we do want to give them music that'll help them, you know, get pumped up while they're playing the game. What's in, it's interesting you bring up Doom because our, Gordon had talked about his methods when when um 2016 had come out, and one of the things he had said is a lot of a lot of composers for for video game music will build will um do this layered approach. He doesn't. He doesn't like that. He's he's gone on record as saying he hates that setup, because you're at, because you're adding noise on top on top of noise. Yeah. The approach that he had that he had done was was build up musical chunks in a sense, that could yeah. be that that could be a little instead instead of a full track, little tracks that don't, that only last a few seconds, but can be arranged and rearranged according according to the um, game designers. Right, like how intense the fight was, or like if you were low on health, or mm -hmm. something like that. Which 2016 wasn't as good at hiding it as Eternal was, but um, yeah, it's like whenever it was more so based off of like how intense the fight was, it would play this chunk of music, or if it was dying down, it would play this chunk of music. Yeah. Um, well, he was. But with he was, I'd say, I'd say in the case of Eternal, he was refining the um, concept, even with some of the behind the scenes drama regarding the ones that the tracks that he worked on versus the ones he didn't yeah and with well what i mean by that is that like um the the, the programmers weren't as good as hiding it like mick you know he did his job he did it great but the programmers they had some they had some moments in 2016 where like it would clunkily switch from like intense part of the chunk to like low intensity chunk and it'd be, it'd be like whiplash mm -hmm. but in eternal they did a lot better job of like programming it so it's more gradual yeah the uh, now what one of the one of the funny things when it comes to science fiction and you prop you probably noticed this as well is that designing a science fiction world is answering a set of questions and each of any answers to those questions prompts um Prompt answer. Prompt new questions. Oh, I, I think I know what you're about to ask. Oh, it's the it's the what do they eat question. No, no, oh. that'd be that'd be too that'd be too easy. But one of the things I'm curious because a lot of a lot of times, um, science fiction settings start <clears throat> start off with a what if, and for your for the for the world of new Val, of new Valhalla. Um, I'm curious what the what if was in your case. As in, like, what do you mean by what if? Like, what if? What? Just it. Well, uh, to you, to use an ex to use an example of what I mean by this concept, um, I'm going to use Judge Dredd as an as in my example. Um, specifically, Judge Dredd, Judge Dredd in the comics, not not the Stallone movie, which is which was a missed opportunity, or the not that bad, um, Carl Urban one. 
the concept of Judge Dredd began with, began with the question of what if Harry Callahan, i.e. Dirty Harry, was legally empowered to do all that violation of human rights stuff he kept pulling in his movies? Hmm. You know, take take the idea was take the cop on the edge motif and push it to its logical extreme. Okay. Okay, I get what you're saying. Um with Blair Havoc it it was less of a like, you know, what if this happened in the like logical extreme. It was more of a what if this event happened at a specific point in the past, how would it like change our universe? Um because to, I guess to reference the script Bible, I'm talking. I was talking about um, the inciting incident that causes a divergence between our history and this new Blur Havoc history is that uh, sometime in the mid '80s, um, an alien ship crashes in South America, which causes like humans first, humanity's first contact with aliens in the mid '80s, um, and basically from there, I blossomed out and said what would happen to human history you know after that moment how how would it change things like and the answer i came to was that several different wars broke out basically mm-hmm. for this advanced alien technology yeah i do remember um one one project that i've one project that i've covered in the in the past augusta universalis t- took a took a, an approach not too far removed from that basically in that case, it was a, it was aliens showing up at um, in a, in ancient Rome. Said aliens getting their ass kicked because this was this was go, this was during the golden age of the Roman Empire. And the and well, if you if you have a technological advantage and you still lose, you just sharpen the sticks of your of your opponents. Yep. And they ended up expanding and make and making Rome into the into a interstellar empire. Yep, that's basically what happens in my book series. Not not the interstellar part, but hmm. basically what happens in my series. The aliens crash. Humanity, um, because these aliens are biomechanical beings, mm-hmm. so, as in they're they're alive, but they're robots. Basically, humanity learned how to take those parts and implement them with the human the human body so now you've got humans with synthetic implants and parts and stuff and they ended up oppressing a lot of these aliens even though the aliens were technologically advanced mm-hmm. more advanced than humanity yeah and I'm, given given that given that sort of implant I'm I'm curious if you, I'm curious if um if you plan if you plan on doing something that I see I see as a bit of a I see as a bit of a habit that ends up be, ends up being done whenever cybernetics is involved, and that that is t- that is taking the, taking said cybernetics and go and 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 pulling the and pulling the huma- pulling the humanity question or in the in the case of um, Night City the whole cyber psycho thing. Hmm. Um, uh, it yeah, there is a there is kind of like a a situation like that or a concept like that, but I'm not quite there yet. I'm still working out the kinks on that one because I don't want to just take cyber psychosis and put it in my universe. Mm-hmm. I want to kind of like work out like how do how do I put it? Like I want to work out like what what exactly causes it? Because in in cyberpunk, it's just you get disconnected from your body and the rest of humanity while in this universe I want to really like find the cause and effect that would lead to such a thing um but like I said I'm I'm not there yet so I'm still workshopping that idea mm-hmm. but um right now I'm more so honing in on the the checks and balances of it because I don't want to just use cybernetics as an excuse to be like oh now my characters have superpowers which I don't want to do that because that just makes everything makes everything messy after that. But yeah, it's definitely one of the one of the stresses of working on a science fiction project is um, is focusing on cause and effect because it's not like superheroes where you could just say, "Well, that's how we got it," and that's it. Yeah. Um, with science fiction, you have to actually focus on like making reasonable cause and effect. 
Mm-hmm. And it's fun. It's funny you bring. It's funny you bring that up since a lot, a lot of, a lot of times, pe people, people use adv people use advanced te advanced tech to not to um hand w to hand wave these kind of things. As it, as if the the jo the joke the joke that I've used is it's magic and you do have to explain it. <laughs> yeah, basically. Because even in fantasy settings, you can't just use magic as a get out of jail free card. That's a good way to really piss off your audience. Yep. Because um, you can't just have like characters just say, "Oh, I teleported out of this jail because magic," and it's like. How did when did you learn how to do that? Like, what are the requirements to learn how to do that? Did you need resources? Like, what are the limitations of this power? Like, you can't just pull a Doctor Strange two and turn water into wine. You can't do that. Yeah, but it's, in fact, in fact, it's in both in both. This is the reason why um, an easy an easy an easy way to annoy me with science fiction is techno babble. Because it it annoys me at, as somebody who had to endure years of techno babble through Star Tr through bad Star Trek, um, it is it's an irksome thing because well for one you're treating technology as if it's this magic that can't possibly be understood. Yeah. And two, it get it's antithetical to good storytelling. If you present a problem, that then. So then the characters should either have a way to fight their way out, think their way out, or talk their way out. Not you, not use it, not use a win button, which is basically what that is. Yeah, and that's something I went to great lengths to avoid in my book series, because um, there, there, uh, there were a lot of chance to a lot of times where. These books could have been done a lot sooner if I did take the techno babble route, but I wanted to actually sit down and research whether or not the thing I was introducing to the universe could be explained in in um, actual applicable terms that actually make sense to our reality. Mm -hmm. Like instead of just like in the which one is it? The second book, the second novel, I introduced holograms. I didn't want to just say like. The explanation isn't in the second book, but I didn't want to just say these are holograms and they do the flux projection model of Hadron 5 or something like that. I don't want to do that. Like, I wanted to actually like explain in terms that you could look up and look more into. You know, actual terms that actually make sense. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of science fiction falters is that um, the the sign of someone that didn't do research into you know the thing they wanted to introduce uses techno babble. Yeah. Oh, this is the reason why reverse the polarity of the neutron flow became a meme. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> but with now with that with that said, um, I do want to congratulate. I do want to give my congratulations on how the um, how your YouTube channel has. Has has taken has taken a massive leap after that long ass thing after that long ass project of yours. I uh, appreciate it. Um, but when it but something something else I, I suppose I should get into is the Spotify playlist that you had put in regarding do, regarding doing full podcasts around around Blur Havoc. Because. Those sort, those sort of things are just, or just exploring the, the setting in other, in other forms of media is something I think a lot of writers should, per, should pursue. So you mean the, the playlist of like music, or, both actually. Like the, um, I've I've seen a f in in the case of music that's that's one avenue, but also in the case of lore, because. There's there have been a few tabletop devs I've I've seen and a few a few devs in other in other forms that put in a that put in a sort of reference music um, playlist. Um, one of the big examples is um, against the Dark Master, which is doing th which is doing this um, power metal infused type of type of high fantasy. Um, and 
he had made a Spotify playlist dedicated to the to the setting that he had created. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I have I have done playlists for Blur Havoc. There's two types of playlists I have out right now. Um, the first type is just like whenever I release a, a novel, I would have a playlist that kind of like it doesn't necess- it doesn't necessarily work to listen to it while reading it. Um, but it's more of like a playlist that kind of like gives you like a a musical kind of like light motif. A musical not necessarily light motif, but like a, a musical I'm losing the word here. Like a musical run through of the plot where like like if you read the book and then you listen to the music, you can tell what part of the story is taking place based on what song is in that playlist and the specific order that I put it in. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, like if like if it was like the soundtrack to a movie version of the book, that's what that playlist would be. Um, but then the second type is, um, and I'm still building these, are character playlists, which are playlists dedicated to one character that has one specific type of like genre in it. Mm-hmm. Um, like for one character, it's literally a playlist full of like Argent metal that's like in the style of Doom Eternal. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's more so just to like, more so to give you a good idea of like the kind of energy that this character has in this specific book. Mm-hmm. And with with that in mind, what? What do you have planned for for da- for down the road when it comes to just your cha- comes to just your channel and um, the future of Blur Havoc? Oh, um, well, I'm gonna keep it uh, short term for now because I have a lot of plans. Um, but for YouTube, um, mainly focusing on because that long video I did that's kind of a an anomaly that's not really what I wanted to like focus my channel on it was just a project that I felt I wanted to do because I I want I had things I wanted to say about that um that I didn't find anywhere else on the internet but mainly for my channel it'd be more so focused on like analyzing videos and not videos analyzing movies and talking about storytelling and even talking about the audience reaction to storytelling and and franchises and stuff Mm -hmm. with a little bit of possibly introducing some some conversations and what's the word conversations and information about my book series Mm -hmm. and with my book series there's quite a few books i have planned i'm still working on one right now but that one's kind of a hassle because it's the largest project I've ever worked on, and I've never worked on a book that size before. Mm-hmm. Well, I I will certainly look forward to seeing how that develops. But with all that with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple. Oh, no problem. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Sounds good. If you ever want another interview or, you know, shoot the breeze, just let me know. Mm-hmm. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay Fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>